Oh, for more analysis, Emeritus Professor Greg Feely joins us now live. He is from the Department of Political and Social Change at the Australian National University. Uh, Professor, uh, what stands out for you in his speech and what was the meat of it about? Well, Jokowi is really preoccupied now with his legacy and not only with his own personal legacy as president for the last nine years, but also setting up his family dynasty. He has two, he has a son, or two sons now, who are uh, political aspirants and a son-in-law who is also heavily involved in politics. And he is hoping to, at every point, underscore the achievements that he has made as president. And those are primarily in ensuring that Indonesia has had a very quick recovery from the COVID period. It has growth in excess of 5%. There's been reasonable growth in employment, reduction in poverty. There's been large um, investments in infrastructure. And a lot of Indonesians can really notice a difference in that. Better road systems, transport, port systems. It's not perfect, but they can see a manifest difference in Indonesia now to what it was when he took office. And so he is emphasising those things very strongly. Um, I'm sure you'll come back and have more questions about the, the new capital city, but I think that's going to be one of the biggest question marks about his um, uh, presidential achievement. Oh, Professor, some analysts, though, are mixed about his legacy, even critical of Mr. Widodo, for example. In the past, there were concerns about democratic backsliding after his re-election in 2019. Last year, we saw student protests about the new criminal code. Uh, Nusun Tara also a thorny issue for some people. Uh, what do you think has been most challenging for him and his image? I think those criticisms of Jokowi and democratic regression are certainly justified. And uh, there is a lot of things that have happened under his rule, not, not necessarily directed by Jokowi himself, but nonetheless, he has allowed them to happen, um, presumably orchestrated by people around him or people close to him in his supporter groups. Uh, and a lot of this takes a form of intimidation and state repression of people who are critics of the government or dissenters from government policies. And a lot of people who are critics of the government find themselves targeted in a way which creates a, a lot of stress and sometimes trauma for them. So uh, that has been a, one regrettable element of Jokowi's um, presidency. Uh, I think uh, specifically on the uh, capital city issue, it's going to take a vast sum of money to even bring this partially into fruition. And as much as Jokowi wants this to be a signature element of his 10-year presidency, I think once he leaves office in October next year, um, his successors are going to have to look at this very um, closely uh, because it's going to absorb so much money and that money could potentially be used for a whole lot of other things that will deliver a bigger dividend for Indonesia nationally. So uh, I, I, I'm sure that the current arrangements for the capital, so there will be something for Jokowi to open um, in the last months of his presidency, but whether the full plan of um, the, the total relocation of the capital from Jakarta to, to Nusantara in Kalimantan takes place, I think there's increasing doubts about that now. And very few international investors in it, it will create enormous budget um, pressure for Indonesia if they've got to fund most of that themselves. Mm, and Professor, let's look at the presidential election next year, which you mentioned earlier. Uh, in his speech today, President Widodo sought to distance himself from claims of some critics who, says, uh, who say that he is interfering in the political process. Now, we know that a decade ago he was considered an outsider, but now he's firmly part of the ruling elite. So what is your impression of how influential he will remain going forward? Uh, Jokowi is playing a very astute and in some ways subtle game at the moment because he's not explicitly endorsing any of the three main candidates. That's the current Defence Minister, Prabowo Subianto, um, the Governor of Central Java, Ganjar, 
or the former governor of um, Jakarta, Anis Baswedan. Uh, he certainly doesn't want Anis Baswedan to become president. And I think we can assume that he will take um, uh, various measures to make things as hard as he can for Anis. But the real question was, would he throw his weight behind Ganjar, who is backed by the party that Jokowi is currently close to, PDIP, or Prabowo? And increasingly, he is leaning towards Prabowo. And there are various behind-the-scenes manoeuvres that have been taken place, presumably with Jokowi's strong blessing, that have... Um, indicated to Jokowi's support base that Prabowo is his preferred candidate. And I should point out Jokowi's popularity ratings at the moment, approval ratings, are about 82%. This is record levels of approval from the Indonesian electorate. So in a close-run presidential election, having the tacit support of a person as popular as Jokowi could really be the decisive factor in ensuring that or in leading to Prabowo becoming um, the next president. So uh, that's a game Jokowi is playing. He's not overtly saying he's for one candidate or another, but nonetheless, if you look closely at the signs, uh, he is he's putting winds and wind in the sails of Prabowo, not of Gunjab. Now, Professor, also for, for some time now, powerful politicians have been proposing ways to keep Mr Jokowi in power beyond his second term. It's also another thorny issue. Has it got any public support, if at all? No. So when you mentioned before about the less democratic side of Jokowi's presidency, so this was one element. There were really two proposals. One proposal was that the constitution could be amended to allow Jokowi to have a third five-year term. And the other proposal was that his current term could be extended from five to, say, seven or eight years. And the excuse used for this was that the COVID pandemic had disrupted the government's plans and that it would make sense to give the, an extra few years to fully implement um, his um, policies. Both of those failed. Uh, one of the reasons that they failed was the lack of public support for it. Also, within the political system itself, there were some concerns about what the consequences might be for the individual parties that make up the ruling coalition. And certainly if you were um, Prabowo Subianto, the, the current front runner, he is 71 years of age and he doesn't want to wait another three, four years to get his chance of becoming president. Given his age, he really wants that to happen now. So there were both political and also legal and I think also ethical uh, factors weighing in here. No mature democracy suddenly extends the term of a president to that which is set out in the Constitution. So, again, it was something that Jokowi never formally declared his commitment to, but he must clearly have been giving the green light behind the scenes to people who are running this agenda for him. All right. Thank you, Professor. That's all the time we have. That's Emeritus Professor Greg Feely from the Department of Political and Social Change at the Australian National University.